What's going on, fam? Welcome to the Eat My Assets podcast, your go-to spot for everything personal growth. In today's episode, we'll be speaking with Mitch Loxamana, CEO of Metaverse HQ. Metaverse HQ is a Web3 company that enables users to earn rewards for their engagement in games, apps, products, and digital experiences. In just this past year alone, Metaverse HQ has generated over seven figures in revenue on top of raising seven figures in pre-seed funding. Today, Mitch teaches us how the power of relationship building can lead to extraordinary results for you and your career. He talks about this in the context of jobs, where he was able to double his salary by talking to strangers on LinkedIn. He talks about this in the context of building a business where the wants and needs of his fellow Discord community members eventually led him to building a product that helps solve these challenges. He also talks about this in the context of raising money and navigating the challenges with his team and investors during fundraising to secure a successful raise. A lot of great info here. You don't want to miss this. You know, you went to Rutgers University. Yep. Electrical and computer engineering. Like, yes. yes. How, how was that? I graduated as an uh, electrical computer engineer at Rutgers, like same as you, and uh, went into the workforce not really uh, knowing what to expect mm. and was completely over- underwhelmed by how involved I was in actual um, <clears throat> driving decisions for the company, for the business. I worked very much on the uh, as an entry-level employee for a... Uh, embedded systems company. And, and what's so, embedded systems for people? That- it's basically the 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 software that uh, what we would create was the electronics um, with the software that would be put into uh, vehicles. Uh, so um, it, I personally worked on the software side of it, right, coming out of college, and um, it, it was really... Uh, depressing how (laughs) little innovation there actually was, how many limitations there were uh, when it came to creating, right? I wasn't developing new programs, new code, uh, new features. I was working on basically enhancing older feature sets and it was just so boring. I didn't get to work with, you know, anyone. uh, I wasn't client facing at all. And so... Um. What that first job did for me was uh, it helped me finance some of the, you know, other ambitions that I wanted to explore, right? So in my free time, I was learning how to hack social media, right? I grew a couple of Instagram accounts uh, with over 20, 30, 40K followers, right? We, uh, we did the same thing. Yeah, you're, yeah, you grew a cat to 25,000 followers. You even got yeah. featured in the Targum. Yes, the, exactly. The Targum. Exactly. So I, I just, what you know, uh, s- was staving off boredom, really, right? And and learning how to do things that were not necessarily related to engineering. I, I think that's when the entrepreneurial path started to really kick in again. And um, it hadn't kicked in since I was in grade school, like selling tech decks and gum to kids on the bus. So. Oh, so you didn't do anything in college. Everything happened like right after college when you were working that job. Yeah. Um, I think high school to college, I was like pretty much locked in. I got to graduate, do this and do that to, yeah. to do so. That was like the primary goal. And then, you know, then life is not what you expect it to be. It's not as fun and entertaining and engaging. And it can be quite monotonous. So in that monotony, <laughs> right, I'm just like doing shit on the side and um, keeping myself, you know, entertained. And like through that process, it helped me gain a better understanding of what I wanted in my own life. I knew I wanted to make a million dollars by the time I was 30, right? And I knew I wanted, I, I knew that where I was in that job uh, making I don't know, sixty-five thousand dollars entry level, right? Out of First college. job you're talking about. First job yeah. ever. Uh, I knew th- that was not gonna be the place or the profession in which I could achieve, you know, that financial goal. And yeah. so, yeah, I, I quickly moved to Verizon and I worked as a solutions engineer, which is. And before before you get to the Verizon piece, because that's that's also definitely interesting. That's a nine thousand employee company. Mm. 
Um, like to, to set the stage for everyone else on the, the first job, DTS, think about uh, office with cubicles. Uh, DTS, DTS is a pretty big company too. How big is DTS? 5,000 employees. Something oh like that. shit. Uh, yeah. They're way bigger than I thought. Yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, they, maybe that's wrong, but they, their competition is Dolby digital, right? So, mm. you know, those are two really big uh, companies developing sound formats. Yeah. And for like, when you join a big company, it's, it's, it's less about building like new features and whatnot. And it's more about optimizing, uh, what you currently have. Um, or optimizing the current code that you have, right? You don't want to change too much in a system because it already works and a lot of people are using it. So that's what, the, when, you, when you think about joining a big company, especially for software engineering, just to give context there. Entry level, a lot of people think that software engineering, you're just going to make six figures. It's not true. I, mm. I know many, many people that have the same route as you, but like, how did you even land that first role out of college? It was sort of uh, the first opportunity that it was just right right place, right time. I was visiting mm -hmm. career fair, sort of just purely out of boredom. It was uh, in between classes <laughs> and DTS had approached me and I interviewed well. That, I only took one interview and I didn't really, um, I, again, I just wanted to get practical work experience. I didn't really have a dream to go to Google or Facebook or any of those like tier one companies. Yeah, I simply wanted to continue down the track. And also I didn't know you don't know what you don't know, right? So I thought 65000 was a lot, yeah. like coming out of college where you're making nothing. In fact, you're, you're, you're like paying, right, to be in college. <laughs> so it's like to go from now, um, it, to go from not self-sufficient to full self-sufficiency was, um, was my allure. And so I just took the first opportunity. Yeah, uh, Especially where we are in Jersey. So that was like especially a lot of money. Yeah. Um, over there and I'm guessing so all the pursuits that you did it was more of like a creative outlet on top it's, it's, it's what it's sounding like yeah you're doing that because you need a creative outlet outside of that job like it just wasn't enough fulfillment for you true it, is, is that accurate to say yeah it, it was not as um, <clears throat> it was not as engaging as I had anticipated hmm. I didn't really know what to expect and I quickly had to fill that ambition or like, you know, the, the hole in me that says I, I could be doing better yeah. with other shit. And so the other <laughs> shit, basically my job funded the other shit. Oh, uh, so you're just putting money into your side ventures that you're trying. Yeah. Like I bought screen printing equipment, you know, I purchased softwares. Like I was just, all that money was going into all these other side things that I was learning about. Yeah, that makes sense. And then all, all of that like coming together, like when, when was the time you decided like, hey, and how long did that take of like, hey, I, I need to make a switch? And That um, from like within the first job? With it, within the first job, yeah. Probably like week one. Oh, shit, so you yeah. knew right away. And it's kind of scary how when you think about, when I think about that job, I worked with a lot of older people that were very afraid to lose their job, mm. right? So they just like, never do anything new or fun or awesome or, or speak out of line, speak out of turn. I was like, damn, this fucking sucks. Cause if you're afraid to lose your job, you're not really like, you're, is your job really worth losing? Right. Because, um, mm. if that's the frame in which you come into work every day, you know, that is an exhausting mindset and it's not like a forward mindset, right? Yeah. You're not really, trying to be innovative, you're simply trying to play within the rules. And that's fine if like, you know, if it's a company like that, I guess. But that being said, you're also lacking innovation. Like when's the last time you heard of DTS and, you know, um, anything exciting that they've done? It's like, they don't do anything exciting. No one's yeah. excited to work there, right? And, and like, it, it just ha it had that lack of like, of passion and I think that just stemmed into everything that they did and every uh, like the way in which people were and there were some awesome people there I made a lot of cool friends but everyone just always talked about other places and places they could be <laughs> and all that stuff and you know no one ever actually made the move and I, I made the move pretty quickly I, but even then so I think in a year and a half is far too long to be working there I should have made mm -hmm. the move after week one but it's easy to see how complacent yeah, well, it was it, it was very apparent how complacent, how easy it is to fall into that complacency. 
of working a job that is so monotonous and you're afraid to lose it. And so you might end up working a decade and you blinked, right? And time just went by just like that because it's so easy for time to just get lost. That's like, a scary thought. Yeah. That's a scary thought, actually. Like, do you think it's a... You think it's just a company culture? Th- was it a company culture thing? Was it just age? Was it the area? Because you're in Jer- like, yeah, it was so many in things. bumfuck Jersey. It was you know so what I mean? many things. Yeah. yeah, I was in bumfuck Jersey, and then my next job, you know, the culture was younger, more exciting. The technology I was working on was more innovative. Like the uh, the the role was more client facing, so I got the pitch, and um, that's a whole adrenaline rush when you're actually in sales. Uh, and that's what the solutions engineering role is, right? It's the combination of sales and engineering. At Verizon Media, right? Which yeah, is a funny Verizon story Media. of how you even got, you shouldn't have even gotten that job based on, you know, what you did <laughs> yeah. or how you showed up. Like, uh, wh- what was that experience like? Cause that's a funny story of how, uh, you know, your, your interview for that job. Yeah. Basically went from making $65,000 working like nine to six, having to go to the office every single day. And the office was in, Jabumbafuck, New Jersey, to <laughs> making 140K plus bonus, having to only go in the office maybe once a week. The office was <laughs> a cool, swanky, four-story. Um, you We would listen to problems that clients had and try to build and find solutions there. And I got to work with a lot more people internally. And so it was just a lot more of an exciting opportunity. And I think the best thing you can do, especially if you work for a company like a corporation, is to always look at other options, right? (laughs) LinkedIn's a really powerful tool to keep your pulse uh, in in a potential new direction for yourself. And I did that for about three months, found a, a bunch of different opportunities. I didn't even know what a solutions engineer was and that that position existed and that it fit more my skill sets. So you're just spraying and praying basically is what you're saying. Well, what you're saying. Yeah. Like I was having them. a yeah, lot yeah. of conversations with random people, so many nameless people that I can't even, um, remember. And they all led me towards, uh, Verizon media. And that interview process was interesting because they really try to nail you on how much do you make, right? Because they're trying to <laughs> lay a basis for how much you should make, uh, at their company. And so I was pretty stern on, never giving that number. I never did. Well, you had a good line too that you helped me out with when I was doing negotiations for my contract. What was the, what was the line that you used when they ask you what salary are you looking for? Yeah. The, the line is, so if they ask what, what the salary, uh, how much you get paid now, you basically, Oh def- yeah. How much do you make right now? Yeah, when they ask Cause you that's that. the yeah. big question. And yeah. you, you deflect, you, you say something on the lines of, you know, um, the amount that I make for the current position and rolling in this company does not, would not reflect how much I uh, should make at uh, your company uh, under, you know, the role that's uh, being proposed. And I only, and then you have to like, you know, add another. <laughs> and then what if they're like, uh, well, how much do you expect to make? Yeah. So if it's like, how much do you expect to make, then you even go one step further. You need to do your research, but you go, listen, you know, uh, I'm only looking to make as much as I should be compensated for. Right now in New York City for that role, you can look it up on Google. I look to, uh, I expect to be paid at least, you know, the the average salary for that role in New York City. And I love again, that. You I still just, don't give a number. No, I never yeah, give a number. Give a but number, I knew you on, on yeah. like Glassdoor and all these other, like um, if you Google solutions engineer, like how much does a solutions engineer make in New York City, you're going to see a number. And you know, they're going to see that same number. And so you never actually say a number. That's the whole thing. Dude, I was so nervous the first time I did that. Um, I remember the my first job, that recruiter, I did the same thing you did. And she asked me about the same question in five different ways. And I didn't have a response outside of those first two. So when she asked me like the third or fourth time, I was like, uh, you know, same as before. It like depends your, on the work that I'm doing over there. Yeah. You know what I mean? You have to stay on your ground. Yeah. And not say a number. Because once yeah. you say a number, you're fucked. Yeah. You know what I'm yeah, because they'll anchor. Yeah. <laughs> That's the number one thing they're looking for. It's like, what's that number? Because they'll just pay you a little bit more than that, right? Yeah. But, bro, that interview process was hilarious that you went through, too. Because didn't you show up, like, an hour late to that fucking interview? Yeah. I, I, 
mis- mistakenly took the wrong train and the train went to Brooklyn and I was supposed to be, <laughs> you know, uh, in the East Village. Uh, yeah, so I was late and I kicked it off with the head honcho. He was the director of solutions engineering at the time, Jeff Geyser. And a lot of everything in life is relationships. It's personability, especially in sales. A lot of the times when you're selling and pitching a product, the defining factor is, do they fucking like you? (laughs) Right? Like, are you a normal person? Yeah. Uh, And the same thing works with hiring internally, especially, right? They want to make sure you're a good culture fit. So I was late for an hour and <laughs> an I, hour, long story short. Yeah. And I communicated oh, the whole time what was happening to Jeff. I'm like, I think I just took the wrong train. I'm so sorry. I'm not from Jersey. Or I'm from Jersey. I'm, I, I'm not used to New York yet. And when I got there, I saw he had a Gary Vee sticker. So it was game over. I was a pretty fan, <laughs> big fan of Gary Vee. So I just talked about that for like most of the interview. <laughs> and yeah, I ended up getting the job. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. One for, going to one forty k, which is nuts. And then that standpoint, like, were you still doing some side hustles at, at that standpoint? Um, for the first year, no. I want. I was really excited. I wanted to get up to speed, all that stuff. And then I realized I had a lot of time on my hands when you're in sales, particularly a solutions engineer, when you don't have any problems to solve, <laughs> and you're closing <laughs> clients left and right you really don't have anything to do, right? Yeah. You're not working with the development team and building feature sets and improving. You're simply the conduit, right? You're the representative from the engineering side for the sales team. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the times I had free time. And so my second, third year, we did Artifacts Media. Uh, we did that together. And so... Oh, we, that's a crazy... F- yeah, that was actually my first exposure to blockchain crypto nfts was doing artifacts media and that was a crazy experience i forget about that sometimes that's fucking nuts yeah i mean that was big for everyone right that was that was a transformative experience for julian dory specifically right he saw that we were we had full-time jobs and we were also doing shit on the side that was completely bonkers and that we didn't know what we were doing and had a 12k a month contract yeah (laughs) Just figuring it out. Yeah, exactly. Ads, man. We were just spending a shit ton of money. <laughs> yeah, shit ton of money just learning how to do ads. And, you know, we had some experience with, with digital advertising. So we were taking all the skills that we had accumulated, right? Especially my time at DTS, growth hacking, social media accounts, and then creating media like photo and video. Uh, we leaned on some of the best people to do that. And then we found ourselves in the crypto space. Um, during that time when we built Artifacts Media, doing marketing. 2018 video. for everyone else. So this is when yeah. like ICOs and whatnot were huge. Um, B- before the the massive crypto winter. Yeah, and 99% of the companies went <laughs> down under there. Went to um, zero, yeah. But like e- even that, for instance, right? Uh, b- basically built a ragtag team mm. of just like five kids, all partners, by yeah, the way. Yeah, all five partners. founders in an LLC. Yeah, Five founders in an LLC. so ridiculous. Most of them living in a house. Um, yeah. And... And, you know, that first contract, because I know I know for a fact you're the one that actually led that conversation um, pitching basically like a, a, an RFP, pitching the CEO of why they should use uh, the artifacts media services for 12K a month, which included video, web development, like anything under the sun, right? Um, full service agency. Like, can you walk us through that pitch a little bit? Because you're 22 years old. You were young <laughs> coming out of college anyway, so you were yeah. young when you're pitching for us, like the five partners to this guy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we basically built a company, pseudo company under an LLC with five of us. uh, And we had a pitch meeting with the CEO of Freight Network. And not really the CEO, I guess he was the head of everything, right? He was the chairman. CEO at the time. Yeah. uh, Maybe he was CEO at the time time, before they brought in Sloan Brakeville. Yeah. But that pitch was hilarious because we just pulled uh, screenshots from all of our growth hacking from Instagram, all of our <laughs> Facebook advertising we did for an e-commerce uh, brand uh, called Malika Beach. And all the metrics, basically just metrics, data, and that pitch was incredible. It's just five of us and him. And we're absolutely crushing. And then at the end, he's like, great, how much is this going to cost? We got 12000 <laughs> He goes, perfect. I'm like, fuck, we didn't ask him. <laughs> like, we could have easily gotten thirty, But... 
We went in suits and everything, full suits. Like, we didn't know what yeah, we were doing. full suits. I mean, we hadn't even fundraised. Like, we just didn't know how to actually start a company in the modern age. The modern age is like, you get a team, and then you go fundraise, then you build a product, you know. But what we were we, an agency, so it was a little bit different. You didn't, it's we not had like services. Get rent. Yeah, services. we had services. Yeah, it's so it's not like you usually get funding for that. Yeah, it really wasn't that scalable at all. Right? <laughs> so we had to we had to go to New York a bunch of times, film, do this and that, create the content, create the ads. I mean, none of it was scalable, but all of it was so fun. And didn't John though during the pitch wasn't weren't we like two slides in? He's like, guys, 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 stop! Like, I like you guys. I blacked How much? out. I don't yeah, even remember. I like black. I, I was, bl- so, I was so elated, dude. I, I remember we got pizza right after. And I was like, that was fucking crazy. <laughs> we were so nervous. Yeah. It was crazy. I mean, to be in a position where you're that young and it's, and by the way, this is your side hustle, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. you, you know, you have a completely like normal job making a lot of money and, and you're still like suiting up and going into New York to go <laughs> pitch for your like fucking you were still working your job startup. you were yeah. working it was working hours yeah yeah basically yeah. working hours and it was transformative and that experience not just from what we learned having established that company and rendering those services providing them but that access to crypto was really massive our mm. first one of my favorite experiences that we had with Artifacts Digital was going to Consensus's ethereal convention in Brooklyn, yeah. me, you, and Matt. And that was a, a crash course into what crypto is and could be. We saw Joseph Lubin there, a bunch of other people. That co-founder of Ethereum. Yeah, a lot of awesome yeah. like OG Ethereum co-founders, developers, et cetera. And I watched a, we watched a crypto kitty get auctioned for like $114,000. Yeah. I had never seen an NFT before. At the time, I couldn't even process why anyone would pay for that. I didn't understand the, the tokenization of assets yet. It was a digital cat, by the way, for everyone else. It was an NFT, first of its kind. Dapper Labs. Yeah. First project, broke the Ethereum blockchain. The people who made NBA Top Shot, for those of you familiar. So that was my first time ever seeing an NFT. And then... Today, right, to be able to say that Consensus is an investor in our company is so full circle because the first time I'd ever seen an NFT was actually at their convention. In 2018. Three, four, five years ago. Yeah. And, and Consensus, so Joe Lubin was a part, who is the founder of uh, Consensus. Consensus, which is MetaMask, Infura, Linea, which is their new blockchain, but MetaMask yeah. is like the number one Web3 wallet yeah. to hold crypto. So NFTs. consensus basically for everyone else, it's like the biggest and most established crypto yeah. company. I don't think anyone's close to them. They're incredible. They've been yeah. they've been great partners and it's super fortuitous that we were at their convention and that was like my on ramp into crypto, but I hadn't fully, we were doing marketing services. Wearing right? suits and shooting videos and yeah. drinking. <laughs> exactly. And so we, we were, we were within a different frame and perspective at that yeah. point. And when that fell, um, due to creative differences and, you know, we just kept spinning up new things. We wanted to continue to make products and services and like have the side hustle. And then it wasn't really until we moved to New York city when we did Project Aeronaut, we were going to launch that whole thing. And then COVID happened that that's when I really delved into NFTs, into crypto, into Web3 and find myself here today. While working the same job at the time, Verizon. Yeah. Yeah. yeah while yeah. working at Verizon. For and we're, years. we're thinking the timeline for um, Verizon. And I think one thing to note before, between um, moving to New York City and when the crypto winter happened, so in between period, did try the media company one more time. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, when was the point for you? Was the point for you of like, all right, fuck media companies when you lost all your shit? Or like, what was the... Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, we, we it was like a growth hacking media company, right? We did growth hacking services, like helped gain exposure for Facebook accounts and Instagram and LinkedIn, all that stuff. So shortly after Artifacts, by the way, so if we're thinking of time period around 20, late 2018. Yeah, we had a couple clients there. That was that was interesting. And then we were doing media at 
conferences and yeah, when all of our shit got stolen after that one amazing conference, I was just talking to Julian about that recently. That was a catalyst for a lot of us, right? That was a catalyst for me to, to say, okay, fuck this shit. <laughs> like $10,000. I don't gone. want the headache anymore. You didn't even want to get involved. Yeah. In anymore. Yeah. I, I was pretty much over it after we had gotten robbed, uh, that unfortunate, you know, after the, the conference. And what was so unfortunate about the robbery specifically? Like obviously $10,000 in equipment, but. It was a lot of work. We did a lot of awesome interviews, Jesse Itzler. I mean, we had so many bangers and all of it was stolen, right? Uh, along with the $10,000 worth of equipment, which is replaceable, right? Uh, stuff is stuff. Uh, but the actual content that we captured also was stolen, and that was tough. Yeah. So that, that was pretty much like, okay, this is a sign. We need to move on. <laughs> you know, <laughs> let's like, let's get out of here. There's a time where you couldn't let it go. So, right, for I'd say for weeks after, you did everything in your power to get everything. It was true detective. I mean, me and Julian were in Jersey City wearing suits and ties and going door to door and pretending we were the fucking detectives and <laughs> just trying to piece this whole thing together. Like fast forward, we're hanging out with a fucking gang at three in the morning in Jer downtown Jersey city, uh, because we thought we had our, our culprit and you know, all that to say we were not able to get our <laughs> stuff back and we tried very hard. Uh, we got it published in the news quite a bit. And again, I just, I just lean on the cumulative experience, right? I, I knew how to, get press around it because I had done it for my cat when I was growth hacking. Uh, oh yeah. Brand. So you even got articles to be able to get yeah. out of it. Yeah. yeah. So we were interviewed by some reporters who normally wouldn't give a shit about a bag being stolen, but you know, we framed it as, listen, there's a lot of thefts happening. You see, there's actually a spike. Ours is, uh, is simply like a use case for how many, and you can write about that. And, and so the cops don't do shit. Cops don't do shit. So we were, yeah, yeah we, we there's we a did, video of the guy that's stealing it from the car. Like yeah, everything. We, from we the have car. a video of the culprit and like we still couldn't catch him yeah. and get our stuff back. So that was that was a um, good forcing function to get the fuck out of there. Yeah. And, and so moving forward to the, you know, and this is how we're getting into the MBHQ side where you're at now, CEO of. Um, you know, for uh, initially getting to NFTs, you were still at this point. This was like what, 2021? You were still at this point in Verizon Media. Yeah, it was actually 2020, still at Verizon, and we're doing Project Aeronaut, and Tim puts us on to NBA Top Shot because <laughs> Bailey is uh, working with Gemini, and he's in the crypto space and loves NBA Top Shot. So we were pretty early in NBA Top Shot. That was a really exciting product and platform, super easy to buy NFTs and sell them and make money. And like when you make money, it's, it's, that's the hook, right? <laughs> when you make profits, like, oh my God. I'm and like, NBA Top Shot for everyone else, they partnered with, um, so Dapper Labs. NBA partnered with Dapper Labs and what they came out with is were NFTs, video NFTs, not true NFTs. And I don't, I won't get into the specifics, but basically you could buy these video moments and clips. They were, uh, they were real as NFTs. Like, as like cards. They were tokenized. It, it was on the Flow blockchain. So yeah. they were real NFTs. They weren't just digital assets on their platform. Yeah, but if like, you know, if the database ever went down, people wouldn't have access to it. It wasn't like true. There wasn't another marketplace. Yeah, 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 the, yeah, I mean, it was, uh, the Flow ecosystem is quite centralized um, uh, on purpose. Yeah. There's a lot of control around it. But sorry, I go for edge. Well, I want to make sure I have the context for everyone yeah. else yeah. when they think NBA Top Shot. Yeah, it's like that, think of trading cards, digital trading cards. That was eye opening, and it was so fun, right? We were all doing it, <laughs> waiting for booster packs, and we were on Discord. Like it was the first time I actually ever used Discord, and it was so exciting. And what was more particularly exciting, even after our account values went up so high and then crashed back down, it was still very exciting because. A, you got to see a lot of people excited about this technology and like participate in an ecosystem. And then B, like, what does this mean for gaming? What does this mean for art? What does this mean for everything else? It's like, this is uh, the tokenization of, of digital assets is so exciting uh, to actually truly own these assets, right? Buy and sell your League of Legends skins or your, you know, Minecraft, whatever assets. Like, 
it was there's a lot of what if right which was different than crypto and just a currency where people are exchanging it and it's pretty much uh the game theory of like how much does this other person think this is worth? well there's some of that but in a sense currency didn't have inherent value well outside of cryptocurrency it tokens are considered fungible by nature right like in the same way that the u.s dollar is fungible yeah where you take two U.S. dollars, they're going to be identical in value, mm-hmm. right? Same thing with crypto. You take two Bitcoins, they're going to be identical in value. If you yeah. take two non-fungible tokens, uh, they're going to be, you know, um, inherently different in value potentially, right? Yeah. And what does that mean? Well, that means if you take two different League of Legends skins or gun skins, for instance, they won't have the same value, right? Someone is going to, you know, there's going to be different market uh, values for what you can buy and sell those assets at. One's going to be more rare than the other. That's what made it really awesome, right? So yeah. it's like this, like, it really enabled uh, the first wave of NFTs, which was just digital identity, mm-hmm. profile pictures, avatars. And that was really awesome to be on the forefront of. So from NBA Top Shot, I found Metaverse HQ. Well, NBA Top Shot, too, I think you're leaving out a big component of this. You were a top 10, because there it used to be charts of the people that were making the most money yeah, or someone built an app. This I was like, that'd be crazy if NBA built that, but you were like top 10 and, um, it came crash. It all came crashing down eventually, like all fun things. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. and you ended up losing 90% I, of the value. I ended up losing money then making money. Oh, you I, ended up even losing money. From yeah. That. So I could have oh, made, so I could have made like 130 grand from a, 10 to 15 K investment. I just watched it all go to zero. <laughs> and the unfortunate thing about that was, and maybe it's fortunate that you, we saw in real time how supply and demand affect portfolio evaluation, mm-hmm. right? If the company has the supply and they're constantly distributing packs and NFTs and all this shit and the demand can't keep up, there's not enough users coming into the platform then you're go- going to see, you know, the entire ecosystem sort of collapse into itself. Which uh, is so they start coming out like hundreds of thousands of cards, quote unquote, like these NFTs, NFTs and there's yeah. just too much supply at that point. Yeah, and that's down. that's a pretty common problem, right? You, yeah. you just over dilute the supply, yeah. and then it makes things worthless, right? If there's so much of something, then it's going to be worthless if the demand can't keep up. And so that was eye opening and sobering. And I took that lesson with me into the world of NFTs because NBA Top Shot was was built on uh, Flow blockchain, which is was developed by Dapper Labs, mm-hmm. the same company that created the Crypto Kitty Crypto that got Kitties. sold at Consensus that we watched in real time. Yeah. So the NFT market boomed. It was it wasn't on Flow. It was on Ethereum. And so NFTs on Ethereum was like the hot thing. And I had found Metaverse HQ because Jake and Bake, the founder of Metaverse HQ, he was really into Top Shot and he was providing people a lot of value through his Twitter. He would listen to Top Shots every Thursday. They had a uh, public office hours, right, where they would speak with the community, give them updates and on the platform. Can you explain people MVHQ a little bit, what it was before? It's different now. It's evolved, but like yeah. what it was before when you first saw MVHQ. Yeah, so what it was was a Discord community private Discord community where we talked about NFTs and what is a good investment, what's a bad investment, what are some upcoming NFTs that are, that are interesting, which ones are we fading, et cetera. It was just a, a cool community uh, to talk about NFTs. And it, it had some of the most forefront individuals uh, from a lot of these big NFT projects like Top Shot. There's a... Uh, NFT game called Zed Run, for instance, trading, racing, digital horses. So you had a <laughs> lot of different professionals and people that were really attuned to the market in Metaverse HQ at the time. And I had come in, basically I was I was trading, I was also creating content around NFTs and pushing out those videos. Jake liked those videos a lot and <laughs> let me into Metaverse HQ. I filled out a Google form and everything. And then <laughs> it wasn't- the community. Yeah, yeah. And then it wasn't until like 2021 July that uh, we launched our first NFT collection. And, our fir- and basically the NFT gives you access to the community. So we opened it up. We, I think we might have only had less than 100 members and then we sold 1,500 keys 
1500 NFTs that gives you access to the Discord community. And that was when the whole thing really kicked off and we were pretty well positioned as the first quote unquote alpha community. They call it in the Web3, we're, we're, we were considered an alpha community, which is just a community of people that are, are fully trading total DGENs, trading NFTs, buying, selling, flipping, et cetera, but doing it in a way that was not coordinated, but doing it in a way collectively where we are gathering insights from each other and um, making very precise decisions on those insights uh, and obviously being very exclusive. So, And alpha for everyone else, can you explain alpha just in general? Yeah, alpha is information that can either make you money or <laughs> help you mitigate your losses. So if you catch wind of, you know, uh, a bit of alpha, hey, this project looks very interesting. Here's why it's interesting. You might not know that the founder is from this or the artist is from that. And uh, and so that's considered alpha. So part of being in, a, in an alpha community is that you're providing alpha to other members. You're receiving alpha from other members. And that's the value is that you mm. can make money or mitigate your losses based off of you know, these tips, which is why people of. wanted to be in these communities. Cause like it's an investment sure. obviously, but you come out making money. Sure. And that's how we started at first. And we morphed it evolved in a, in a way that was leaning towards education, leaning towards partnerships. And really what happened was we became power users within Web3. We knew every product, we knew every platform, we knew every launch. Just because you're we buying. Knew, yeah, <laughs> like we knew the technical limitations NFTs. of every single product, like from marketplaces to tools and uh, wallet solutions, what kind of headaches you should expect with different blockchains and uh, those different ecosystems. So inherently we became power users and uh, every year we have had a new NFT launch to welcome new community members and also welcome back old ones. Every Anyone can buy the NFT and be a part of the community, which is awesome. Um, and we really have, over those past two years, right, since July 2021, leading up to now, October 2023, we've leaned on not just our, like, power using of NFTs and crypto and Web3, it's now more centered around education more convicted long form, written alpha, uh, a lot of expert led courses, tons of courses on how to do this, how to do that. Uh, and a lot of uh, really content with other communities, other leaders in the space, partners. We've done over 500 partnerships, for instance. Partnership would look like you know, an AMA with our community. We'd, we'd have a founder of some other place and they'd be launching an NFT collection to give us the pitch, <laughs> right? And then everyone would get whitelisted to this NFT, which is basically reserved access to purchase the NFT f directly from them. And the idea was that perhaps, you know, uh, on the secondary market, you'll be able to flip it, sell it for higher. And we made so much money doing that, like over 30 million for, our, for just our humble community That's in crazy. value alone. So I would say it was like a really incredible experience going from like, power degen user trader and NFTs to now over encompassing all of web three, bringing exposure to a lot of these products, becoming an investor in some of these products too. But how did that actually happen though? So like my question is you started off as just regular, like imagine someone just joining a random community mm -hmm. of a bunch of people from around, like distributed community around the world. Yeah. And you're just like a, a member at the time, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. I was a member and I wasn't even part of staff. I remember I hit Jacob probably like, end of summer 2021 was like, listen, I'd love to get involved with the team. I think I could bring a lot of value in terms of how we work with other communities, partnerships, and help build the brand. Uh, so they made me head of marketing and strategic partnerships. I was like, all right, perfect. I'll take that role. <laughs> Great title. Yeah, yeah. yeah fantastic title. So that was my side hustle. And it slowly became, became my main hustle. Uh, at the time, around Oct November 2021, Jacob Meyer, our now chief operating officer, he hit me up. He was working at Near Blockchain, and he was in our community, loved it. He goes, I will literally do anything for you. It was like that scene <laughs> in uh, Wolf of Wall Street, like, I will quit my job right now and work for you. <laughs> so we we loved his ambition and his grit. And, you know, me, Poop, and Jake were like, let's pull the trigger on this guy. Like, he, he sounds really locked you in. You weren't full-time either yet, though, right? No, yeah, no. Yes. So... We locked him in and we gave him a bunch of uh, shit work and he, you know, excelled <laughs> and 
did it. And so that was a good test. And Jacob was, has been a primary driver of partnerships. And, uh, it, like if you want to work with our community in any way, if you're an outside product tool platform, like you're launching an NFT and you want to work with us, like chances are you're, you're getting finessed by Jacob. Um, because me, him and, um, a handful of others, you know, we have really great oversight into our pipeline, but it wasn't until, you know, me and Jacob really got the swing of things and we were bringing cook after cook, partnership after partnership, bringing our members whitelists, uh, access to tokens, like the nine yards. It wasn't until like March of March, April of 2022 that I was offered to be the CEO of HQ. And a month prior, I had already quit Verizon because I was like, I can't be, I'm, <laughs> I'm fully engaged here and I can't be 10, 20% at Verizon. I, I I don't, I owe more to my boss who I, I really appreciated. Uh, and, you know, my boss's boss, I really loved that job so much. It, it granted me so much freedoms, right? And exposure mm -hmm. and experience. Um, the that solutions I, I engineering job you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. But I quit, obviously, having already made so much money doing NFTs. Like, I looked at how much I had made, and it's it was like... It, I can go into this full time. This yeah. amount now justifies myself like leaving 160k, like 140k plus. It was easy for job. you to make the decision at that because at that I had point. security, and yeah. I could always go back if need be, right? Yeah. So I, I knew at the time I was like, "This is what I want to do." I didn't know what we were gonna do, and <laughs> really, I didn't know we were gonna develop a product or a platform because when it's the bull run, all you want to do is invest and. Um, really just trade and play the market. Everything right? fucking goes up. That's yeah, exactly. So, so we were just engaged the whole time. Uh, around June of 2022, uh, we had found Blur, which was our last uh, big investment. The investment we made before that was Looks Rare, which was brought to us by Dingling, a really awesome uh, OG member of Metaverse HQ and also just a big like influencer, I guess. In they, they were investing in marketplaces, by the way. So similar to OpenSea, where you could buy, sell, trade NFTs is, is what he's referring to. Yeah, yeah. And, and those were really fantastic, right? It's like, imagine you invested into Robinhood and you received money for every transaction on Robinhood, <laughs> right? Every transaction a trader makes on Robinhood. That was the same deal that we had with, uh, with Looks Rare. And then when we saw the NFT marketplace blur, got to work with the founder. We were the first users on Blur. We helped incubate the product, accelerate its growth uh, in terms of network, right? We brought in other alpha groups, other power users, traders within our network, other communities. We did as much as we can to really help Blur uh, get to where they are today, which is the number one leading marketplace uh, for almost eight, nine months since they've launched since and, October, 2022. Yeah. And, and for, and for everyone else to get, to give context. Um, so and it sounds like you can correct me if I'm wrong here. MVHQ just in general, when you think about a power alpha community like that, every project wants to partner with an, a, a community like MVHQ because that community is all buyers. Like you want as an NFT project, to sell out your project, obviously you make money there, but also they knew MVHQ was the community that could do that for you. So they had so much power. They pretty much had first dibs on any projects that were coming in. So imagine all the supplies coming to you and you get to decide because you've gotten so big, you get to decide, no, nah, I don't like this project. Oh, okay. This project. Okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll yeah. ape in. And then, and then you kind of went to like, not only now are we aping in, we have so many partnerships, so you get to pick and choose the best projects because they're all coming to us. Yeah. You started to come kind of become kind of like an accelerator VC where you're actually able to invest in these companies or help them go to market. And like yep, yep. you slowly started to go towards there just because of what was happening. A lot of the potential partners we saw were had already built their communities and they were gonna launch their NFT or their product and platform or their token. And they just need a little bit of a marketing boost, right? Maybe some content, maybe an AMA with us because we publish really good content. We create incredible, incredible, um, you know, uh, video and written form around it. And we have a distribution network. And obviously, the network effect stems at HQ. We were the first to really formalize a process uh, at which can uh, accommodate the scale of the projects, the supply coming to us, right? So we were able to pick and choose. And again, when when we became 
it wasn't just our liquidity, right? Like communities, if you had a 10K NFT collection and you had 50,000 people interested already, you don't, you don't need a community of 1,000 people, right? Yeah, that's true. Uh, that's really not valuable to you. You're already going to, um, your primary goal is to sell out and generate as much revenue as possible. You're already going to do that, right? So um, it wasn't just the liquidity that people were coming to us for. It was, it was the exposure. It was the gravitas. And then, and then it soon became our feedback, right? Because, again, when you become the power users of these products, of these platforms of, within the NFT space, you're now not just valuable to people that want money, you're valuable to people that just want feedback, right? Mm -hmm. And these are real builders that are developing products and uh, want to innovate on um, you know, what the space looks like. And Blur, I think, is a really fantastic example. And there are other examples that I can name where there was a really great value proposition. They came to us early. Hey, Ninja Alerts. Ninja Alerts, NFT nerds, right? We've worked with Nansen. I mean, there's so many products that we've worked with, but Blur was the one where it was like, it was such a great product, uh, super early. We liked it. We, th we saw a lot of potential in it. It had a token, uh, or there was going to be a token that was launched uh, eventually, and he was also fundraising, right? So <laughs> the value proposition with Blur was really interesting because this was at a time when we had already done 300 plus different partnerships with upcoming NFT drops and games and all that stuff. Our members were cooking. This was the <laughs> first of its kind where now you have a value exchange happening between a product and uh, a community of power users, right? Almost like a, a built-in product incubator of just uh, the most insane DGen users you want, right? Our, mm -hmm. our, we've traded over $2 billion worth of NFTs uh, collectively amongst maybe a couple thousand people. So if you're building an NFT marketplace, obviously you're going to want to come to us. We know all the pain points uh, and we know all the features that we want and you're building for us. That's perfect. So there's this happy exchange there. And for that exchange, the reason we knew it was going to be positive EV, basically positive EV means it was going to make everyone money, a lot of money, was because they were going to have a token airdrop. So the way that token airdrops work. Let me just take a step back, right? Because it's really interesting how a conventional company that has nothing to do with crypto NFTs and a company in crypto actually works. Mm -hmm. Where, let's just take an Uber, for instance. If you're Uber, you're, if you've built, imagine you've just built Uber. Okay, now you need drivers. Now you need people to like want uh, car rides, right? So how do you incentivize user acquisition? What are some of your channels? Uh, uh, and, and how are you bringing those users to actually use Uber, right, if you're starting at zero? Well, you might do things like um, you, you might incentivize users with discount codes, coupons. You might incentivize drivers with bonuses, right? Or if you're on our platform early, you'll get X amount. Yeah. And you're pulling from a reserve of money that you just have, right? Um, For because, them, it because you funding. Because yeah. you fundraised, yeah. right? We were the opposite. We had never fundraised ever. And so everything that we were doing, we, we've always just been money hungry, revenue driven because we had to be. And so um, a lot of these companies though in uh, crypto and NFTs, they get funding, right? So when a company gets a similar situation, Blur for instance, right? Built this great NFT marketplace, has zero users, how to get users on board. This is the same model that a lot of companies in crypto follow Basically, they incentivize, user, they incentivize users early by providing a promise of future reward, mm -hmm. right? So maybe Uber is like, hey, you come here early, we'll give you $100 worth of uh, Uber credits for, like the, for the first three months. Mm -hmm. A lot of different traditional companies will put out similar programs. Crypto just says, hey, come use our pl uh, product, come use our platform, and the more you use it, uh, you will get an airdrop of our cryptocurrency uh, when we do ha uh, create it, we'll give it to you for free, right? Mm -hmm. So the idea is that, okay, a lot of users want to come in and participate in that platform and that product, uh, mostly in hopes of... The product being good, the which then the cryptocurrency... Well, mostly, something. mostly in hopes of getting the token if and when the token actually does ever launch, right? Yeah. That's the other thing. A lot of companies will say, oh, we're going to launch a token. But don't get there. But but never get there, or yeah. it takes them too long to, to, to actually launch a token and reward those early users. Mm -hmm. Where Blur, it was like, we have a great product. They are promising a token, and we want to get our users on that as soon as possible because, A, we already know they're going to love it. This isn't like a product that's shit, and we're just, quote-unquote, farming the token. Farming meaning 
you're just doing useless actions on the platform so that you can get more <laughs> rewards if and when the token ever launches. Yeah. We like this is an actual product that we'll use, right? It's going to we it's already habitual that we buy and sell NFTs. This product will fit into our habit. And we made a deal basically. And, and again, this sort of this framework, this deal was really big because it just showed us uh, and uh, the power of our community and our users and our members. The deal was, we'll get our users onboarded early. You'll have your own feedback channel where you can interface with our members right in our Discord. So real-time feedback for the product uh, that you're building. And then you can cont continue to iterate on that product. All that we ask is that everyone that we onboard onto the product, um, which we were the first users, will receive a bigger chunk of tokens when you do finally launch your token. And... Anyone that's interested should be able to invest in your token round, right? So in a traditional uh, non-crypto NFT setting, you have a seed round, you have a series A, series B acquisition, whatever, right? Uh, in the crypto NFTs, you have a seed round, and then you might have uh, uh, what's called a token round, which is similar to a price round, like a, C, like a series A, series B. But the token round is, is not for equity, it's for tokens only, right? <laughs> so when they ever do launch a token, you'll get that allocated amount. And you're sort of, it's the same thing. There's a valuation. And if you're putting X amount of money, then you should look to receive X amount of tokens. That's the idea. And we got to, so for the for the audience here, when he mentioned Seed Series A, so if I'm a company, I'm trying to raise money right now, let's say it's pre-Seed Seed, I'm giving up a percentage of the equity of the company. So let's say I'm giving up, let's say I'm giving up 10% of my company I'm giving that up to the investor in exchange for like 500K uh, cash. And I own 10% of that company. In this case, the token round, what, what Mitch was saying was same exact principle, except it's not a percentage of the company that you're getting. Um, it's a percentage of the, uh, the total amount of tokens that are going to be generated. Yeah. And with, in that sense, right, like the whole idea behind the token itself, like it's not necessarily like a, a stock in the company, but the intrinsic value behind that token is because that token will eventually be used on not the just on for the platform. Yeah, on the platform itself. So if it's being used and the platform successful, inherently that token itself goes up. And again, this is separate than actually owning equity, the equity in, the in the company, it's like, which uh, is interesting. The way I like to equate uh, and this is what I find really interesting in the crypto NFT space. It's this value exchange between builders and users. So if we take the example of Uber, for instance, right? Uber is a publicly traded company. They have shares that you can purchase right now. And in their app, they have maybe Uber credits, Uber cash, whatever, right? And that's per account basis. Well, if you're an early user of Uber, you're not getting shares in their company when they <laughs> publicly IPO. You're not yeah. getting free money. Once for you got the Uber. inside, get, yeah. Inside, like inside. you have to have been an investor or own equity in the company so that by the time that the IPO, those shares are actualized, realized, and you can sell them for real money, right? Mm -hmm. Uber might give their first thousand power users or their first users on the platform. Uh, some free credits, right? Uber credits. You get a hundred dollars worth of Uber credits. Well, great. You have to spend. There's utility with Uber credits, right? It's not nothing. You can yeah. use it to uh, buy rides on Uber. Um, the challenge, though, when it comes to a crypto company, right, like Blur, for instance, um, they obviously have equity that they've sold to early investors, similar to how an Uber might have done that to develop the product and the app. But what's cool about a token is that they're is intended utility on the on the platform and when you give a token uh tokens are actually you know cryptocurrency it's liquid right you can go on coinbase you can go on binance and sell that for real us dollar or you know whatever type of you know currency fiat that you you'd like to and what blur did and what we worked together on was have uh, ensure that all of the early users were rewarded, right, with their currency, with their token. And that's why the token is such an interesting medium. And that's what makes crypto and NFTs particularly interesting is this value exchange. Is that if you are an early user or early adopter of our product, a platform, blockchain, protocol, whatever, uh, you will eventually be rewarded, right? Mm -hmm. And that reward is not something that is meaningless and you have to use it on our platform, right? You can go and sell that token 
uh, right away. You can go sell to someone else. So like, let's just say I didn't like Uber cash. I don't like Uber. I use Lyft all the time. If I got a hundred dollars worth of Uber cash, ideally I, I should be able to exchange it for a hundred dollars worth of Lyft. Yeah. But that's not how it works. Have right? you like Fortnite too? If you played a lot of Fortnite and Fortnite had a, like a token, like the more you play, the more current like in-game token you got, then you could buy skins with that. Like that, that could also be valuable to other people. Exactly. Which is why they want to pay you cash for the tokens that you earn playing that video game, for instance, yeah. you know, to... That's crypto and that's NFTs. It. It's just, imagine, it's the tokenization of asset, digital assets. Imagine if every asset in your video game that your favorite multiplayer online game, whatever, was tradable to someone else, someone else could buy it because there's inherent value, then um, that is exactly what it is like in the crypto and NFT space. Every asset is effectively tradable, and there, <laughs> there is inherent value in those assets, whether yeah. it be tokens, which are fungible, and then NFTs obviously being a lot more unique in characteristics, metadata, usefulness, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And, like with what happened with Burr, and obviously Burr ended up being a success. Community, you invested in that, and you know, looking, looking out, we're looking forward. Is that when you started to realize like, Oh shit! Maybe we could build something similar to like the success we've been finding now. Or like, what was that thought process after that whole ordeal? Because at that point, you're thinking like, I think we have a company. At th so at that point, we were still figuring out what we wanted to really like, what the next level was going to be. Right? We had built this sort of reforge for Web three business model, couple of thousand members year over year, providing them access, services, content, education. Right and investment opportunities and we were crushing it and after blur it was it was almost easy to fall into the wow we really made it because blur was a fucking cook like <laughs> not only did we invest in the token round at a really favorable valuation of the token and we'll see that unlocked for the next like 38 months so every month everyone that invested is getting a nice pro rata share of tokens so it's just like straight liquidity uh, we also were airdropped, right? Given these free tokens, once the platform created the token and launched it, uh, we were airdropped. Now for using the actual app, like yeah. outside of the investment, yeah. you're saying? Across yeah. like 900 Metaverse HQ members, we were airdropped uh, almost $20 million. Like I personally made almost six figures in just the free token airdrop, right? Of yeah. the Blur token, which is instant liquidity right then and there. And so after that, it was pretty easy to just fall on that success, and be like, we're gonna find more blurs. Don't worry, right? <laughs> it's not very easy to find blurs, especially yeah. in a bear market. It's actually uh, much more difficult, right? <laughs> yeah. And where we really came into the vision of our platform, which is effectively going to look like a questing platform, so users, companies are bridged together through this incentivization layer of questing, where. I like to think of it as Eventbrite for Web3, but basically you're a company and you want to drive user acquisition, right? You want to drive users to your platform to perform specific actions. You go on our platform, you create missions, campaigns, quests, you know, whatever you want to call them. We call them missions. And you decide what objectives users need to complete and what the reward is going to be for each user. Maybe mm -hmm. it's tokens, maybe it's an NFT, maybe it's you know, um, a discount to your pro subscription. Whatever the case might be, we, we want to be quite agnostic. But as you can see, we've now, uh, we're working towards a, a commercial uh, consumer-facing product as opposed to just serving a 1,000-plus users while also keeping those 1,000-plus like power users of our community that we've established for two years in mind as we build this product. How will it benefit all of our users, right? Um, so when we got to that point where we knew we were going to build this product, this was the one for us, we knew we wanted to build something. We had some of the best development uh, personnel that I've ever personally worked with. And I've worked with a lot of incredible people. But we've always, what made us really awesome is that we've worked together, we had worked together for nearly two years at that point when we had envisioned the product uh, we had great working experience together. We understood the community. We had a really great brand. We had a lot of um, a really massive network. And um, and the experience actually to build this product came from all the partnerships that we ever did, right? When we would facilitate these partnerships with other communities, we would use tools uh, and different platforms to 
to service these partnerships. Mm -hmm. And then we were like, why the fuck don't we just build our own? Right. So then the bear market really lets you sort of simmer on the two years and go, okay, what can we develop that will position us for the next bull run, right? For the next wave of of mass adoption into crypto and NFTs. Mm. And we came up with this product and um, we've been building it for a couple of months now and we have over a hundred. I mean, if you asked me two months ago, I would have been, I would have been happy to have 15 uh, partners, businesses in Web2 and Web3 commit to using our product when we launch. Uh, we've got about over a hundred now. So now the the challenge for us is how do we... And what do those partners mean in, t- in the terms of your app? Yeah, so they want to create missions, right? So I'll give you a great example. Arkham is a uh, platform, a web app. They just launched through Binance. So they have a token and it's really just like a, an analysis platform. You can go analyze different um, wallets and, um, you know, just it's a place for data. It's really cool. You can analyze other people's wallets. Yeah. So so you could track wallets, you could track tokens, token prices. So it's just really, it's, it's a nifty tool and they we're going to host a mission with them that basically, you know, gets their token in the hands of people that uh, complete their mission. Their mission is going to look like, you know, uh, create an account on Arkham, right. On their platform, like follow, share this tweet, Mm. you know, watch this video, whatever the objectives are. So they want users, they want engagement. Everyone wants users, right. And users want things worth of value, which is tokens, NFTs, et cetera. So that value exchange, we're really leaning into that for our product. So it allow users to like, potentially be able to make money for free. Oh yeah. You just, well, not for free for, for their engagement. Oh, for their engagement. Well, yeah. not sorry, but make it's basically, it could be a side hustle for yeah. users. The same, same as NFT stuff, but yeah. while also it's, it's win-win basically for yeah, the it, company it, and the it's user. It's win-win. Exactly. There's yeah. that value exchange happening on our platform at scale. That's the idea. Mm-hmm. And again, it, it didn't, it didn't happen overnight, right? We we started our first two years as quote unquote alpha community and really service like servicing our business model looked more like a reforge, um, and then we realized after doing literally over five hundred different partnerships, investing in two massive companies and having oversight into thousands of power users in Web three, we came up with this product with this solution that we're really excited about, leveraging this incredible brand and network that we've you know, accumulated over two years. So let me ask you this question then. When it comes to the community side of the house and then the app that you're building now, what led you to the decision overall to say, hey, we're going to make these two the same versus making them separate? Yeah, so the community will always be its own thing, right? We'll always have that power user community and very low supply. If we are going to do a community for the product, that will be like more public facing and anyone can, you know, participate. Oh, are they not the same today? No. Oh, I got no, that no. mixed up now. So yeah. they are separate. They're separate today. However, they're connected, right? Because got our you. success is, is highly predicated on our, on our power users, right? On our network, on our brand. And so gotcha. we're finding ways to integrate the utility to our members. But what really also helped us find vision for this product was the fact that uh, we could not do this at scale. Like doing 500 partnerships, facilitating them through the products and platforms and solutions we were using was simply not scalable. It was a lot of work. And we were like, hmm. okay, let's build this for our community. And then we figured, wait, let's not just let's let's not just stop there. How do we scale so that we uh, can capture as much of this action, as much of this value, as, as many partnerships as possible for our community, right? Mm-hmm. That's really where it stemmed because if you think about it, to facilitate a partnership or to do anything, it's going to take X amount of time, resources. Yeah, we were very. We're, we're, everyone's limited in resources, right? So, yes, we did 500 partnerships over the past two years, but you can also say that we could have done 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, <laughs> right? Mm. Why couldn't we we do that? Well, it's mm, because we were limited saying. in resources, and yeah. so this product was also a vision for helping us scale uh, the potential number of partnerships that we can do and free up bandwidth. Uh, for, you know, so we can focus on other things. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then it just so happens, you know, we like we saw real commercial application for this and we've seen a couple of competitors in the space um, really like tr- try to nail it and th- they're like absolute trash. <laughs> and for some reason, they're like $100 million companies. So like, we can do better. Oh, wow. So they've ever, like even com- competitors that are close have raised 
Yeah, they like raised. Time to yeah, million. a competitor of ours launched a token last May, and that token was over 130 million in market cap. Oh, so through, they rose. Was the money mainly through the token? Well, they they had raised uh, like eight figures already in a, oh, in a, shit. In a Series A, oh, and then damn. they launched the token. And they're probably and evaluated as a, a, probably yeah. a, a six figure or nine figure. Yeah, probably evaluation. Yeah, so, I mean yeah. the token market cap alone was nine figures, so yeah. obviously their their evaluation is, from the equity side might be a lot higher. That's wild. Was that back in like 2021 when anyone no. and their mother was no, going? No, that, oh, that was recent. That was last 2020. Yeah, like Holy literally fuck. after Doquan and Luna Terra, after basically oh, shit. Uh, crypto went from three three trillion dollar market cap to less than one trillion. That's when they launched. So, so again, there's like yeah, there's a lot of demand for our community for our power users, but then. What companies really want are power users in general, right? They mm -hmm. just want users to come, try their products, uh, and engage with their experiences. And what users want is make it worth my time. Right? <laughs> our, our job is what well, it, it's always been for two years: making it worth people's time to engage. Yeah, dude, that's a you know. And I remember when you first told me the uh, idea initially, and as someone that was in the space as well. Um, Made a ton of sense to me because that's what everyone was doing anyways. But you had to find it through a different alpha groups, you know, and mm -hmm. it also wasn't widely accepted at the time. And it still isn't now to be able to like go in a product, test it. And it's more open. It's unless you have a gated community, like what you mentioned, that like the access to try these things out was much more gated. Yeah. You know, to have the it opportunity to, to even do it as like uh, as a I, user. So I'm pretty confident that we will find like the next blur, so to speak. I'm hoping the next blur finds itself through our platform. I'm hoping mm -hmm. that we are able to incubate products at scale instead of with small private community of a thousand users, incubate products at scale, reward users at scale. And we basically are the facilitator. We sit as the middle layer. We sit as the middle man, that layer for users and creators businesses to come together and really flesh out that value proposition together. And what's interesting is like you could have an application or whatnot in theory of the people that come in, but regardless of people who come in, it's not like you're necessarily um, shilling any projects because the user doesn't have to pay any money. Yeah. They will just be a reward from what they do. And if the project doesn't work out, it's not like they actually invested money into that project. Yes, that's true. There's going to be a lot of missions where you take it's, the application simply. Aside. Yeah. There's going to, yep. I mean, it's self serving, right? Yeah, so yeah. if you're a business, you might want to say, hey, if you're an NFT marketplace, uh, one objective could be sell an NFT on our platform, right? And what's beautiful about smart contracts is that it's very easy to be able to track if a user had done. Has uh, we can validate if a user has actually completed that action. Actions, yeah. Uh, there are going to be a lot of missions that are simply like share, follow this account on Twitter, and <laughs> you can potentially win a thousand dollars worth of that in game or on platform currency that you can eff effectively sell right away. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of missions and the variety of them in terms of the difficulty and the barriers to completing that mission and what that reward will actually look like. Those will all be different because our platform will be fully self-served. Any user can come on, participate in missions. Any user can effectively create an organization and thus host missions as well. Yeah. So we really want to incentivize supply, right? And this isn't like a Web3 thing. This is very much just if you've built a dual-sided marketplace where you really need to focus is the supply because in order to meet the demand and continue to bring in more demand on the user front, you need... The supply side, right? Mm -hmm. If you're, a, if you have a, a dual sided marketplace like an Eventbrite or uh, uh, an app where you can buy tickets to concerts, well, if there's no tickets to buy, users will have nothing to fucking do. Yeah. So you need to constantly stack the supply, and we've done that, um, and we've really focused on supply obviously over the past few months, yeah. while also building the product because we know we have the users, and we know the baked in supply brings in the users, right? If mm -hmm. you have Taylor Swift tickets listed on your platform. Taylor Swift's fan base is going to drive to your platform. That's already the demand right there, right? So mm. supply actually brings in demand. And uh, and then the framework of missions is just kind of brilliant because it continues to keep users engaged, right? There's something in it for them. In the same way that there's something in it for buying a Taylor Swift ticket on your platform uh, where you know it's very valuable. Maybe it's the only place to get it. 
whatever exclusivity, whatever the case might be, yeah. there are um, th- user retention is really built in to the framework of a mission because users are expecting to get something in return for their engagement. Yeah, and that makes sense. And when you think about you know outside of the revenue that you're able to make, you've 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 all made seven figures of revenue in the in the past year and whatnot, and uh, you went through the pre-seed funding looking to get seed like what, what was that process like and you're a different kind of company than people that typically get pre-seed because usually pre-seed people don't even have a product or they don't have revenue yeah so in we many cases. when we started our fundraising efforts um we didn't have a product we we weren't even pitching a product we were <laughs> simply saying listen we we intend to build one here's what we've done <laughs> over two years we don't know what this product will do you just threw stats at the investors yeah just basically just traction stats the entire <laughs> deck was just traction and it was crazy right the traction's insane like i mean it, it's really incredible two billion dollars of volume traded 1.4 million revenue brought in over two years here's the business model that we've currently served um, here's the number of partnerships, number of revenue we've driven to users, right? But how did investors receive that, like, though? Because how would that be different than like a, a Reddit community for like stock trading, you know, saying like, hey, here are all the people in our community and they're stock trading? I think our early investors, so we had like a, uh, we had a strategic round, basically just pre seed friends and family. And we went to ecosystem leaders in Consensus, Polygon, L Bank, Gate, uh, which are two crypto exchanges, uh, Stacks blockchain, right? A, a, another blockchain uh, alongside Polygon, a couple of different funds that were in network. And we said, basically, here's everything we've done over two years. We will build a product. We don't know what it's going to do or be. <laughs> However, trust us because, you know, here's our experience and just, you know, be confident that we're going to do something that's meaningful and worth it, right? And we mm-hmm. have the 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 manpower, the right people, and the brand power to achieve it. A lot of the times when you build a product, or this is what we see at least, great, it's a great product, but no one's using it. Why is no one using it? Well, you, you're not selling it properly. You're not mm-hmm. s- selling it at scale. You're not selling it efficiently. Great, you built the best product, but if no one knows about it, who gives a fuck, right? You're not going to find success nonetheless. And... We, coming from a sales background, I was really confident in our ability to like really sell a product. I didn't know what the fuck the product was going to look like yet, right? We had some ideas, but again, they were just ideas. We didn't want to like put them in a pitch yet, especially when it was the strategic round. So we had a round. During this time, by the way, the world was falling apart. I mean, SVB collapsed into itself mm-hmm. and VC funds, as you know, it were getting smoked. Layoffs like, are happening. Not just layoffs, three, just Web2. The everything. entire market's yeah. been crashing. Yeah. We've been in war. Uh, there's been a, a war happening for over a year. So we fundraised, like, we started like early January, um, fundraised super early, and we leaned on some really incredible people uh, within our community and also in our network to advise for us, right, on how to fundraise. Because I had never done that before mm. and I didn't know how the dance looked. And we were able to get in some really incredible strategic partners. Uh, and then async to that, we just had a community round, right? Where we went to our own community, our own members, anyone that wanted to invest, um, you know, they would be allowed uh, to come in in the earliest valuation, right? Gotcha. To join this pre seed friends and family round. Yeah. And that's been really cool because no company ever does that, right? Mm-hmm. In Web3, you build a community, you raise, you fundraise, and then you build a community. Or you build a community and then you fundraise, but you don't let the you, you know your key supporters, the people that like hold your NFT or the people that have supported your product, your platform, your ecosystem into the round. That's kind of dumb. It's hard to get that intense of a community to begin with. Yeah, that loyal. Sorry. Yeah, you know. And that that's what was really cool about Blur that we wanted to integrate. Right, Blur offered the token round an allocation of like ten thousand, twenty thousand dollars to their token round for any of the early users, right, that we mm, brought. Gotcha. And so, like, you know, a lot of people in our, in our community even doubled down and invested in Blur <laughs> and made so much money, right? So that was really cool to see. I like that, the ethos, right? Because you want to in- keep your most important users incentivized and, and part of the upside, right? Because our intention, mm-hmm. obviously, is not to go to zero and spend all of our money and be out of business. Our intention is to go and, and sell this company uh, eventually, right, or launch token, or whatever the case might be, right, it's going to be profitable for investors, and so, yeah, we just hosted a community around as well, and um, I've got to say, 
investing or, or pitching to investors, is, it's just a brand new ball game. And um, it was a really massive learning experience for me. I mean, this year was one of the hardest years I think I've ever had in my life. It was just so mentally taxing, draining, difficult, uh, but also one of the greatest learning experience ever, right? From fundraising to developing a product platform to doing all this while it's literally the worst time to ever be doing any of this. <laughs> like all that has made us so strong after two years of already being super self-sufficient, super revenue driven, um, and, and serving a community and building and incubating one. Um, it, it's been a hell of a ride, a hell of a time. And it, we're only getting started. And let, so let's, let's dive into that. Let's talk about that. Cause I'm very interested in these topics. Let's talk about the funding in particular, mm-hmm. like, Looking back now, you know, what, what do you need to do in order to raise like a pre-seed and what are the, what are the kinds of questions that these analysts, uh, go to Stanford, <laughs> go to Harvard, uh, very easy. Uh, yeah. Like what are those pitches? Like what, what, what happens in a typical pitch? Typically you want to have some sort of platform product proof of concept really, right. In terms of what you are pitching for our case, it was, uh, our proof of concept was really our traction over two years, but we didn't have a product, a platform by any means. <laughs> there was nothing to really look at, right? Yeah. Where you might have a an easier time developing a proof of concept, getting a little bit of traction from that proof of concept, and then being able to use that as, uh, you know, for your seed round, where you then go and invest. And uh, you mentioned that, you know, you had built, a proof of concept and all that stuff. So yeah. that would typically make you very strong in a pitch where what I, you know, realized was that, oh, well, we're really, we're really unable to like strategic investors. Great. Right. They believe in us. They've worked with us before that money was those investments were a lot easier than pitching VCs that are looking for products, platforms and consumer applications. And they mm-hmm. simply, you know, they, they want to know more about the product and like, well, we just didn't have much to showcase. So the other people were investing more into you, but these other people like kind of wanted to see product of some sort. Yeah. And I'm a quote unquote first time founder, right? So mm-hmm. I don't have an exit with a company that a previous company that had started and sold right with Metaverse HQ. If and when we eventually sell, I'll have an easier time, you know, uh, looking to raise another seed with, for a different company, having already done this. For, yeah. So there was a lot of things that were working against us and obviously our traction worked for us and we were able to entertain a really nice uh, pre-seed with some awesome companies that are gonna that are actually value add and not just money in. One of them being consensus, for instance, the yep. or, biggest or company yeah, to have and Polygon. Yep, yep. Probably second biggest. <laughs> so that that fundraising was difficult. I mean, it was really challenging and uh, a really fantastic learning experience that has uh, that will always be useful. It will just always be useful, period. Yeah. yeah. So what, what what would you tell someone then like listening right now like okay, if you're going to raise pre-seed ground up right now, how would you approach that? How do you reach out to people? Yeah, I would say it starts with the people you're doing it with, right? You want to have a co-founder or, or, or a founding team that f- fits the holes that you don't fit. And you have really great working experience with. Ideally, you know, you had worked with them for maybe a, at a previous company or a previous venture. Um, because what I love about my team is that we've worked together for over two years, two and a half years now. Mm-hmm. And we're all very familiar with each other. Right, and that familiarity is very powerful, and we know what to expect out of people. We know how, I know how to make everyone on my team tick, how to drive them, how to ask and communicate with them, and that's very important, right? You you want that stickiness, and I think that's what makes us so unique is that we all came together basically with a passion and love of this technology of NFTs and the market and making so much money together uh, through Metaverse HQ. And also now facilitating all of those DGENs and making sure that, you know, they're also seeing value too uh, as being staff. We have a really unique bond 
versus like, hey, you want to make a company, I want to make a company, let's do this together, right? That's yeah. totally not what happened. They say you want to know someone for at least two years for the success of a company. Yeah, and it was, com- it was completely organic, yeah. right? So like you just have this like super pal- palpable and rich history with the people that you're go- getting in bed with because that's what you're doing, you're getting in bed with them, right? Mm-hmm. You're, you're basically raising this baby together that is your company. And so I'd say start there. And then try to develop a proof of concept. It's going to make your life a lot easier. And when you're pitching, the thing is you want to move very quickly, right? When you have a, one of the biggest mistakes I made was I had a commitment, a really big commitment for 250K from this fund. And then a couple months later, uh, the, (laughs) let's say there are some, you know, marital differences uh, at the fund. Basically the, the, the fund was, was ran by, um, a wife, a husband and it already sounds like not a good idea. <laughs> yeah, it was run by three people, and we were very close to the third person who was not involved in the Oh, uh, shit. Right. So, you know, uh, when there were complications with that fund, right, and the whole thing had to dissipate, right, we did not actually receive that check. Mm. And so, what we should have done was we should have taken the money in right away. When someone commits, you should, t- you should get that money as soon as possible. Take as much money as you can, as quickly as you can, because. Uh, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Oh, well, how would have you done it differently then? Like, what would you have done to tell them to actually, you know? I would have sent them? a safe. I would have sent a side letter. Like, oh, you have you have X Y Z yeah. time because it's closing. Yeah, like, oh, great, you're you're committing. Awesome. Um, sign these documents, and you know, also need the investment instructions. Get their money in the door right away. What What did you do then? I so what I was advised to do was you take their commitment, and that's. That's good. You don't. That's good enough. <laughs> as gold. Yeah. You saying, take the uh, commitment and then you use you. that as traction to go and FOMO in other people. Yeah. But like, fact of the matter is, you don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow. You know, we might be at war with someone else tomorrow. You know, something crazy might fucking happen. Got you. But wouldn't you only FOMO if you're looking at them as like a lead investor? Well, th- the fact of the matter is. And no, well, not no. Sorry, let me rephrase like, that. You're always FOMOing, but I'm saying yeah, like a lead investor in that situation is, is really like. A lead investor is like your your biggest investor, right? It's like uh, maybe it's the biggest brand, or maybe it's the one that's putting in the most money. Mm-hmm. So that's why you can't just accept right away because then you need to make sure it's the right lead investor. Yeah, uh, but at the end of the day, like, what does that really? What does that gravitas really mean, right? Like, as long as you are confident that you're going to take that money and do something useful with it, you shouldn't really care who you're getting it from because let's. Let's face it. Most investors are not really value add. <laughs> so, like, who it's gets a hot up? take in a sense. Yeah, because they'll I be. Mean, are you giving up a board seat? Because they some it depends, bro. Like some investors like have an actual in in fire hydrants uh, in fire hydrant seed. We gave up a board seat, so that person's tied to your company yeah. basically oh, during seed. Oh, so you're still talking? Sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah, during a price round, sure. That's what I'm just saying. Like, lead yeah. investor could definitely make a difference. Yeah, but for your seed, you should just be taking... Pre-seed doesn't you should, matter, you, I guess. If yeah, your neighbor's going to give point. you money, take it. You know, <laughs> like, give them equity. Like, <laughs> honestly, it's just about... Like, I really enjoyed working with our angel investors. We have almost 20 angel investors uh, in our round right now. And... That's awesome. They're all very personable. They're all very well connected, and they're they have we have an easier time interfacing and, and asking for things and working with them as opposed to like, you know, some of the more the the bigger uh, strategic investors, which isn't a problem at all, right? Again, yeah. the idea is that you give me money, I will make your money double, triple, quadruple, quintuple, right? Ten x it for you. You don't have to do a fucking thing. Just give me the money, right? <laughs> no, that'd be nice. That's yeah, the idea. Everything came like that. Yeah. yeah, that's the idea. So. That's what I'd recommend is that you take the money, you take commitments as fast as you can and you snowball, you try to snowball those commitments as fast as you can because you don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. And uh, you really have to lean on the fact that, you know, you have to, you really have to lean on what you have, right? Don't count your chickens before they hash. And having if I were to do the fundraise differently, I would have taken that money in right away. I would have taken it the second he said they committed. So how did you plan then not knowing exactly how much money you're gonna get, how did you plan um as far as like, okay, how much money are we gonna be able to allocate for resources for building this app, go to market, like how did you plan all that, like not knowing exactly how much money 
you know, it was going to come uh, to pre seed. Uh, it was impossible. I mean, it was very <laughs> tough. Like we just, we knew that we needed to, we knew we wanted to build something and we knew what we wanted to build. And also luckily we just had the right people on our team already that could build it. Right. Um, and so it was just a matter of, you know, getting enough money to retain the talent that we currently have for HQ and, um, and then just like use the, the same personnel to build the product, which we haven't, which is awesome, right? Like from the strategic round, we've literally kept just the same team. So you had buy-in from the rest of the team, which made it easier. In other cases, yeah. it could be difficult, but always prepare for the worst. Our team's incredibly resilient and we're all yeah. betting on the upside and we all could be making a lot more money elsewhere working with Google, Facebook, Apple, et cetera. But yeah. we all have a firm appreciation for what this community has has meant for us and uh, an attachment to um, you know, everything that we've done over two years and a belief and a vision for the growth and the upside for what through what we're building mm -hmm. and how we're approaching from a vision perspective. And I think that's, that's really what's held us all together. And I've just been nothing but appreciative of everyone for yeah. really sticking through it and, um, you know, finding their way. We've adapted so many times, right? Like when you're a business model changes like 10 times and you know, in two years, <laughs> it can get really shaky. Right. Yeah. But you know, we were just built different. And so, you know, I think a good lesson from everything that we talked about today too is just understanding creative in different ways that you could actually make money or find success or start a new business because they could come out in, the, the, uh, in different places. Like these are one of the rare times that I've heard a story about someone actually finding success that's originated from joining a community. You know what I mean? So like because you've lived that path, like um, what would you say then for somebody else that is looking to start a side hustle, potentially make that full time. They want to make money somehow. They're not sure how, like if they were to approach the community uh, the approach like you took, like how would they do that? You know, like what, what would you recommend to them as far as like exactly how you did it as well? I'd say if you didn't have like a baiting community, right. You go to your network, right. The idea is that you fundraise for your product, for your idea from people that, know you from people that believe in you as someone that can really deliver on what they're saying. And luckily we already had this inherent baiting community. I didn't need to go shill my friends uh, that understood us better than anyone mm. else could. But even joining that community initially, like not many people find success, like their starting journey is not by joining a community, you know? So how'd you even like, what foresight would you have for somebody else of like, if they wanted to find success in a similar path that you took? You know, how would they be able to approach that situation today? Well, you have to find people that want to do what you do or have a passion or, or appreciation for what it is that you want to do, right? Like, if you want to go disrupt, uh, like, I don't know, tech, right? Go hang out with people at Y Combinator or, like, some fucking accelerator or, I don't know, <laughs> go to WeWorks and just fucking camp. Like, just find people that you can do this shit with and talk about this kind of stuff. Uh, built a network that was inherently what metaverse hq was and has always been was a network of individuals that all collectively uh, were hungry m money driven and uh, which is a powerful motivation right uh financial motivation is one of the most powerful ones and um and on like very well connected with each other Right, mm -hmm. we're basically at arm's length with each other. Even though a lot of these people I've never even met in my life, I just know them through Discord. So you really have to find the community and just learn as much as you can. And from there, like you just establish that network. Well, what if you feel like you don't really have value to provide to that community? Like, how can someone that doesn't that feels that way still provide value in ways that they don't think they can? If you can't provide value, that means you don't know enough. So you need to just learn. You need to just be a fucking sponge. And you just need to learn and bring an insight that maybe someone else doesn't have. But like, eventually you will be a value if you stay engaged. One of our newest members, he joined 2023. He was, he had moved from Brazil to fucking, I don't know, <laughs> Switzerland or something, right? Yeah. And he lives in Switzerland today. One of the most expensive countries ever. And he started with like, I don't know, like a hundred dollars. 
uh, something super minimal, and he ended up making enough money to buy his mom a house. Wow. And Holy shit. he was such a noob. I mean, I found him. I was giving presentations to other communities for our 2023 mint, which was a thousand NFTs for 2023. If you want to be a part of our community that year, you'd mint it or buy it off secondary. And so I was giving presentations to other communities, right, to draw new users in, new people into our uh, member pool. This guy comes out of nowhere and he goes, he hits me up on Twitter. He goes, um, that was the most incredible, impactful 10 minutes. I've ever, I, like, <laughs> you just gave me a crash course education as you've probably given many others. Thank you so much. How do I join your community? Yada, yada, yada. So he ended up joining. He used some of his like remaining spare change that actually meant to pass for over a thousand dollars. And um, the second he joined, he was just a sponge. He was consuming information, very attentive, very alert. His first couple of NFTs that he minted absolutely moon. So he made two ETH already, which was his money back for the the membership fee. He continued to stay alert, grind, educate, network, ask other members. And before long, this guy is just fucking printing money, mm -hmm. you know, because he learned it, right? But it takes time. If you don't know how to be of value to someone, you should shut the fuck up and just listen and just like absorb everything around you and absorb as much as you can and really just work hard at being the best at something specific. A lot of people in our community are focused not just on, um, everything but have very particular focuses on how to be the best at this one ecosystem or how to how to understand what's happening here the best and every play is different and so becoming a specialist almost and and the only way to become a specialist and really the only way to become like valuable about a certain topic is to really just continue to engage and you just shut the fuck up and you listen that's it yeah that was an interesting take on it i thought you're gonna mention something around the lines of like uh okay be the one to take the meeting notes and then you know share the meeting notes afterwards. So at least well, yeah, <laughs> you're providing you values in different ways. <laughs> you know what I mean? But yeah, well, you're saying makes ton of sense. Um, and, and that's why it was like worth sharing for everyone else too. Like that's cause that is, a, that is an avenue that someone could take mm -hmm. to find success. Like what you've had now, now CEO of MVHQ loyal following of in the thousands, seven figure in, in, in revenue. And uh, I don't want to say the pre-seed amount, but sizable pre-seed amount. Um, investing and looking for seed as well came out of the product. So like, you know, that, that happened from you just joining that NFT community to get, yeah. you know, uh, where you're at today and like outside of the, the investment stuff and whatnot, you know? So what, what, what are you like hyper-focused on moving, moving forward, um, from, from this point in time? My focus is obviously my baby, right? The business, we have a full-time, part-time staff, and these are not just, you know, children like us. These are men with kids and families to take care of and all that stuff. So um, there's there's a lot of responsibility that comes with that, and that's been a priority. Obviously, another priority is friends and family, right? I'm trying to prioritize um, my social relationships that I have, my personal relationships, I think those are very important. That can get very lost in translation um, <clears throat> in between the the business and then also like personal stuff. And then um, health is obviously something that I want to start focusing on more of. I've been doing 200 push-ups a day, something like that, like to, to <laughs> stay active. Like before yeah. the bull market, really, I was hitting the gym every day and then you know, when you'd hit the gym and, and then you missed like a project or you miss a uh, financial opportunity to make, I don't know, a couple thousand dollars, you're like, fuck, I'm never hitting the gym again. I'm only <laughs> going to stay online. Like, so I, I really lost that habit. So I want to pick that back up, but it's like balancing all of those things together. Um, there's just so much happening and I would rather have it be this way than be totally bored and, and really not have an answer for you. Yeah. At the minimum, it sounds like then you're having fun. You're at least enjoying yeah, you know, the I mean, it, you are, but you, you it's an accelerated growth period for me, right? Yeah. I learned a lot about fundraising, learning a lot about developing a product, back end, front end. I'm I'm coding again, right? I'm actually leaning on my roots as an engineer, mm -hmm. and and um, yeah, it's an accelerated growth period, and I wouldn't have it any other way. It's it's fun might be a, it's it's definitely engaging. It's fun at times. It's daunting most of the times and very mm -hmm. stressful and uh, thought consuming. That being said, I'm not doing any of this. It's not like go home or go broke or sorry. It's not like 
Like, I know what you're saying. You know, it's not yeah, make it or break it. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. To me, it is. But it actually isn't. I've made a lot of great investments in the space. I have a really incredible safety blanket and a massive network of support, right, should anything go wrong, mm -hmm. that I've established before really diving into this full time. So that's another thing I want to know. It's like you don't have to put yourself in a position where you're just going super, super all in. You know, you can mitigate your losses or actually protect your downside by having all these different safety nets in place. And I just happen to have all my safety nets in place because I was a really good NFT trader. I was a really fantastic investor. It still am. And, you know, now I'm pursuing this brand new venture. It was pretty much a brand new avenue of Metaverse HQ or reinvention, if you will, or maybe an evolution. Mm -hmm. and, and I've seen it both ways in the sense of, because that's always the, uh, an argument that comes up of like, okay, do you drop everything and go for it full time? Which should come with different mental stresses, right? Of like, okay, I need to put food on the table. I don't have any more money left. I can't do certain things anymore. You know what I mean? And you start to doubt yourself. Did I make the right decision? Yada, yada. And mm -hmm. for some people, they still find success through that. Julian Dory, great example, you know, and... Um, and for everyone else, he's, he's a really good friend of ours that has, uh, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of subscribers, followers, everything. And it, it took a while to get to that point, but he, he grinded his ass off to, into your case where you came in a fork on the road of like, Hey, I've done enough experience wise and financially where I know, you know, I can make the decision to leave this job and I'll be okay. Mm. And I want to pursue this thing full time, you yeah. know? So I, I've, I've heard both. And I guess it just depends on the kind of person you are at the end of the day and how you're wired. Uh, and there's been successes from both too, you know, yeah. Yeah. but I appreciate you sharing, uh, sharing all that. And we could be talking two years from now and see, you know, based on what we were talking about today, yeah. uh, how, how everything's been. And um, with, with that in mind, I appreciate you, Hopping on the show today, Eat My Assets. This is the first episode of the new series, Eat My Assets Reinvented. Thanks for having me. And for everyone else, episodes every other week. And if you have any questions that you want me to be asking uh, these people that are coming on, by the way, we'll be speaking with uh, industry leaders, experts, could be anything around the personal growth, finances, careers, you name it. Just let me know. Drop a comment down. And thank you for tuning in. See you later. Cheers. Bye.